الحمد للہ و صلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ وعلیٰ علیہ وصاب اجمعین اما آباد اعوض باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم انا اطعین قل کوثر فصل الب کا ونہر ان نشان قول اختر رب شری صدری و سلی عمری وحل العقدت ملسانی افقا وکولی I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, the Peace TV Chinese, and my four social media platforms, which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, and Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. I welcome all of you to this program. Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik, Season 4, Session 1. Today we have started the new season, that is the fourth season. And I would like to thank Farik for handling the first part of the first session. And inshallah, we'll continue with the second session. And we can do the second part of the first session. Here you are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have asked you and you are unable to reply or any question that you find on the media that's against Islam for which you want to reply. This is the opportunity. You can ask your question on any of my four social media platforms, but the best would be to ask on the WhatsApp as a text message by mentioning your question in brief, along with your name, your profession, your city and country of origin, to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. I repeat, plus six zero double one two six nine five three eight nine five. <clears throat> Before we throw the floor open for the open question or session, I would like to inform our Muslim brothers and sisters in France, particularly, that we are with you in solidarity. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you steadfastness, to give you steadfastness, to give you patience. And we are totally against what's happening in France for the last one month. And we know that on the 2nd of October, the president of France, Emmanuel Macron, said that Islam is in crisis all over the world. And if you go a few days before, there was a trial that's taking place for the killing that took place in 2015 for the Charlie Hebdo staff that were killed by some of the terrorists. And when the trial was taking place in the month of September, Charlie Hebdo again, they published the caricature of the prophet, belittling him, demeaning him, and that's nothing but blasphemy because of which on the 25th of October there was a Muslim who used a cleaver or a chopper and he attacked two of the staff members of Charlie Hebdo after which one week later on the 2nd of October the president of France Emmanuel Macron he gave a speech on how to control radicalism and he went on to say in that speech openly that Islam is in crisis all over the world. <coughs> he said that Islam is in crisis all over the world. And he went on to say that it is wrong 
to portray your religious feeling in public. France believe in freedom of speech. France believe in human rights. We have no problem with someone following certain religion, but to outwardly portray your religiosity in public is not accepted in France. Wearing hijab in public is not accepted. And he went on belittling Islam and speaking against the Prophet, for which the Muslims condemned his speech in different parts of the world. <clears throat> it is uncalled for that head of state, if there is a problem, rather than solving the problem, he is adding fuel to the fire. If someone is blaspheming or speaking against the prophet of any religion, demeaning him, making caricatures, instead of saying that this should not be done, he says this is allowed in the freedom of speech. Blaspheming is allowed. And he went on to add fuel to the fire. So much so that there was a teacher who had a session with the students in the class of tolerance and circulated the caricature of the Prophet, Billah, and had a debate because of which that became viral, what the teacher did. And in retaliation to this, there was a Chechenian immigrant on the 16th of October who took a hatchet and he beheaded that teacher, Samuel Patty, because of which that became world news everywhere. As far as, far as the act of that Muslim beheading the teacher in France, this is not what Islam says. In Islam, there are some rules and regulation, and this should be followed in a country which follows the Islamic Sharia, not in a country which is not following the Islamic Sharia. A person cannot get up in the morning and take the law in his hand or go and behead someone. And this act is not condoned by me at all. And there were many Muslims throughout the world who have condemned this act. But the point to be noted that if one Muslim out of the millions of Muslims make a mistake, that does not mean that you demean the full community, that you speak against the full community, that you speak against the religion, that you speak against the Prophet of Islam. What the person did is to be condemned. He made a mistake. But you cannot go on criticizing the religion of Islam, criticizing the Prophet, and going out of the way and saying that we will make these caricatures public, giving in the media. And you could see that big buildings were hired and paid ads were given so that the caricature of the Prophet was portrayed on torn buildings as advertisements. This is uncalled for. It hurts us and we Muslims, we condemn this act of France, especially the head of the country, the president of France, Macron, we condemn it. He's talking about human values, talking about freedom of speech. He should be the last person knowing what France has done in the colonial rule. If you read the history of France, the France had many colonies, including Algeria. And we know that France ruled Algeria for more than 100 years. For 132 years, the France ruled Algeria, right from 1830 to 1962. And according to historical records, there were 875,000 Algerians killed by France. Some records say up to 1 million. And when you talk about freedom of speech, at that time in Algeria, when anyone spoke against the French government or against the French, they were executed. They were killed. This is history. They went to colonize many countries, including Morocco, including Tunisia, and saying that we want to uplift the civilization. 
we want to civilize these countries, what they actually did was converted them into slaves. And this is what has been done by many of the Western countries. We have the example of UK. They colonized many countries in the world, including India where I come from. The whole of the Indian subcontinent was colonized by them. They started the East India Company in the name of business. They came and they ruled. They looted the country. They plundered the country. The GDP was at the lowest. India, which was one of the richest countries in the world, one of the most powerful countries in the world, they looted it completely. And in their history, they say that they wanted to uplift India. Same thing with the France. Imagine they made colonies in Algeria and concentration camps much before what Hitler made in Germany. And they are talking about human rights to us. It's a shame that the France president doesn't know the history of France just a couple of hundred years ago. What did they do? And what Muslims have today, according to the PEW report in 2017, there were 8.8 percent Muslims who were French citizens. 5.75 million Muslims lived in France. And now it's approximately close to 6 million Muslims are in France. More than 9 percent of the French population are Muslims. And who are these Muslims? These Muslims were brought from Algeria, from Morocco, from Tunisia, into France for labor. Many of them were brought as slaves. And the Muslims today, most of them, they are third generation, fourth generation, fifth generation, born in France. And the French government is treating them like third class citizens. They have the same passport, talking about advanced country, talking about freedom of speech, but they are treated as third class Muslims. They are treated third class citizens. And they have ghetto, made ghettos of them. So when they don't get the equal rights, there is bound to be retaliation. And what you see what's happening, it is unheard of. And in retaliation, there are so many cases that is happening in the world. One Muslim does an act which we know it is wrong. It comes out in the media as though all Muslims are like that. There are so many such cases happening in the world which go unreported. We know of the case that in Toronto, a Muslim, after offering a salah, was there in the car park. A white supremacist comes and slits its throat and the media doesn't report. We come to know from the small media, social media. It's not news at all. There are several such cases. If you see all over the attacks, the terrorist attacks and all the killing that is going on, it is much more done by non-Muslim. And I've given the talk in 2006 on the topic, is terrorism a Muslim monopoly? And I went on 100 to 150 years back that who were the first terrorists? Who were the first person who did the hijacking of the plane? Who were the people who did the first assassination? And when you read history, almost all of them were non-Muslims. It's recently that we find that the media are picking up the black sheep of the Muslim community and they're portraying as though they're exemplary Muslims. And what happens? Two days later, after this teacher was beheaded on the 18th of October, just below Efil Tower, two Muslim ladies who were wearing hijab, they were attacked by a French woman and stabbed multiple times. One Muslim lady, she was 40 years old, the other was 19 years old and there was multiple stab injuries, so much so that the elder lady was in both were admitted to the hospital and the elder lady was there in the hospital with multiple wounds to her lung. And even the younger lady of 19 years old, she had multiple stab injuries. And this was actually not reported. Later on, when the video became very popular and it was circulated on the social media, then the police later on goes and arrests the French woman. Isn't this double standards? France claiming to be a very advanced country, claiming to be a country which has human rights, they have double standards. Imagine 
when 9 to 10 percent of the population of France, they are Muslims. Instead of taking care, instead of living harmoniously, they go out of the way to say that the headscarf will be banned, will be banned, the naqab will be banned, showing signs of religiosity ban. And what do they do? They go and openly they say that we are going to make these caricatures of the Prophet Naus Billah public. And anyone who objected to this, it was a crime. And they went and closed down more than 70 mosques. In the last week, the French government, all those who objected that making a public display of the Prophet's caricature, demeaning, uh, demeaning him, insulting the Prophet, making derogatory statement against him. When they objected, they were arrested. Imagine more than 70 mosques were closed. Not only are they doing blasphemy, but anyone who objects that they consider is not freedom of speech, that they consider as crime. Isn't the double standard? It is nothing but thuggery. That just because they are in majority, 90% of them, they are subduing and they are oppressing the minority. Is this freedom of speech? We condemn the act of the France government, of the French people, especially the president Emmanuel Macron. Emmanuel Macron. And when he said that Islam is in crisis all over the world, he got it wrong. Actually, Islam is the solution for the crisis all over the world. And I've given a talk on Islam, the solution to the problem of humanity. And that will reply to all his answers. What we have to realize as Muslims, that we have to be steadfast, we have to be patient. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us sabr. Whatever these people do, they're trying to instigate us. They want more such cases to happen. Someone comes out of the blue and beheads someone so that they can attack us more fiercely. They can bring laws against us. These things are happening all over the world. And they are done by the non-Muslims in a greater number than by the Muslims. We are black sheep in the community. But what we fail to realize that what the non-Muslims are doing, it is not portrayed in the media. But what the Muslims do, they pick up the black sheep of the community and they portray as though we are exemplary Muslims. I especially condemn what's happening in France and I condemn also the statements made by the President of France, Emmanuel Macron, and, and I would like to say that Islam is the solution for the crisis all over the world. And we as Muslims, regarding what should be done in instances like Charlie Hebdo, had given the reply when it happened in 2015. You can go on the YouTube and see my reply. It's a long reply. Regarding how to reply to statements like that of the French president, you can refer to my video cassette, Is Terrorism a Muslim Monopoly? When they said that every Muslim is not a terrorist, but every terrorist is a Muslim. How to reply? You hear my video cassette, it's for about three hours. And we Muslims, what we should do? Whatever we can, but natural. Number one, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give us the patience and may he, uh, may he grant us the sabr. And we pray to our smarter that throughout the world, we find the Muslims are being oppressed. We find it in China, where we have the Uyghur Muslims in, in Xinjiang, they put in concentration clamps, one to two million. We have seen the cases in in Myanmar, the Rohingyas, in, in the Rakhine states, where they were persecuted. And we have, we have this example that in China, they are not allowed to read the Quran, they are not allowed to pray, they are forced to have alcohol, they are, 
they aren't allowed to fast in the month of Ramadan. This is nothing but oppression. What we have in Myanmar, that we have millions of Muslims who were made to leave the country and they are staying as refugee in other countries. Many of them were killed, many were murdered. Then we have Muslims in Palestine, where we find that the Israelis are doing operation against them. The Muslims, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the Muslims in Yemen, for the Muslims in Syria, for the Muslims in Afghanistan, for the Muslims in Kashmir that are being oppressed by the Indian government, that are being persecuted by the Indian government. We have Muslims in India as a whole, that in many parts of India they are being persecuted. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the list is wrong. It's difficult to name all the Muslims that are being persecuted. What we have to do is that we have to be steadfast on our deen. We have to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be steadfast on our deen and see to it that whatever we can do in our limited capacity. And today, the whole world is a global village. Previously, to make our voice reach throughout the world was very difficult. Unless you owned the media or you had a satellite or a newspaper or a magazine. But today, the world has become a global village. Everyone, they have access to the social media. What we have to do is we have to portray our views and condemn what's happening, whether it be on the YouTube, whether it be on the Facebook, whether it be on the Instagram, whether it be on the Twitter. And in such situation that we know at the time of the Prophet, there were times when the Quraysh, they abused the Prophet, they criticized him. We have the example of Abu Lahab, what he did to the Prophet. At that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals Surah al qawsar The Surah I started to this session with. Surah number 108, where Allah says, Inna a'tayna kal kawthar, fasalli li rabbika wanhar, inna shaniya kawal abtar that we have granted thee the fount of abundance. So turn to thy Lord in prayer and sacrifice. And anyone who hated thee, he will be cut off from all future hope. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising inna a'tayna kal kawthar that we have granted thee the fount of abundance. Imagine the Lord of mankind is telling to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we have granted you the font of abundance. That is, we, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Himself is saying, and in Jannah, there is a fountain or river by the name of Qasar. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is praising our Prophet. Now imagine the Lord of mankind is praising the Prophet. So however much the unbelievers, the kafir, however much the non-Muslims, the ability of the Prophet, when the Lord of mankind himself is praising, that is more than sufficient. We as Muslims, we are hurt, we feel bad, we get angry, but we should see to it that we should not break the Sharia. We should object to what's happening. And we know that then Allah continues and says, Inna atayna kal kawthar, fasalli li rabbika wanhar. Turn to thy Lord in prayer and sacrifice. Allah tells to the Prophet, turn to thy Lord in prayer and sacrifice. And the last verse, first Surah Baqarah wonder, inna shaniya kawal abtar, that anyone who hated thee, anyone who hates the Prophet, he will be cut off from all future hope. And you know what happened to the Quraysh, you know what happened to Abu Lahab, it's there in the Sirah. So all these Western countries, whether it be France, whether it be other countries, whether it be European countries, however much they hate the Prophet, Allah promises that he will cut them out from all future hope. And we have the example. The moment the French president said that Islam is in crisis all over the world, a few days later, one of the French aid worker by the name of Sophie Petronin, Sophie Petronin, she was released after being taken hostage. 
in December 2016, some of the jihadists in Mali, where she was working as an aid worker, amongst the orphans, amongst the people who were mal malnutrition, to remove malnutrition, where she was working in December 2016, she was taken as hostage by some of the Muslim jihadis. And she was kept as a prisoner for four years. And recently, she was the last French hostage all over the world who was released by these Mali jihadists. So when she was released just a couple of weeks back, when she came in the plane, the French president himself went to the airport to receive her. And Sophie Pretenin, she was kept as a hostage for four years. When she came down from the stairs of the plane, the French president, he greeted her. And when she came down, you could see her wearing the scarf. And she said that, I am not Sophie, I am Maryam. Alhamdulillah. She had accepted Islam. Imagine when the people tried to find out that, did they ill-treat you, how are they? She had kind words for those people who were taking her hostage. And she said that what they are doing is for their freedom. And she respected them so much so that she accepted Islam. And it was a shock for the president of France. He goes to receive her and then he finds out that she has accepted Islam. He hurriedly sees to it that, you know, everything is you know, hushed up. This is Allah's planning. They plan and plot Allah to plan. Allah is the best of planner. Allah is the best of planner. Allah says in Surah Imran chapter number 3 verse number 54, makhru Allah, wallahu khairul maqin. They plan and plotted Allah to plan. Allah is the best of planner. Here you find that who the president of France was criticizing Islam and he goes to receive the lady who was freed after four years and he gets the shock of his life that she accepted Islam. And this reminds me of Yohan Redley, who was another white journalist from UK who was taken as a hostage by the Taliban in Afghanistan. And when she was revealed, uh -huh, when she was released, she openly praised the Taliban. And the Taliban only requested her when they released her, that you promise us that you'll read the Quran. And when she came back, she read the Quran and Alhamdulillah, she accepts Islam. So here we find that Islam is the religion of humanity. It is the religion of peace. Why should someone who's been taken as hostage kept in captivity for four years except Islam because she found out the true values of Islam and she realized that what is portrayed in the media is not what true Islam is and inshallah one day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also open up the eyes of Emmanuel Macron and show him that Islam is the religion which has the solution for the problems of humanity Islam is not in crisis all over the world. Islam has the solution for the crisis all over the world. It's not working. This is not working. The Facebook is coming. Huh? It's not coming on the Facebook. Why? <clears throat> the first question that we have that come on the WhatsApp as a message is by Abdul Malik from Nigeria is wearing trouser above the ankle compulsory or a sunnah? A similar question is asked by Abdul Rahman, Kabul, Afghanistan. Is it allowed to wear clothes lower than one's ankle? As far as the question is concerned that 
is wearing your trouser above the ankle is it a sunnah or is it compulsory or is wearing the trouser below the ankle is it haram or is it makro as far as whether wearing the trouser below the ankle is haram or whether it is makru the scholars are divided there are some scholars who say that wearing the trousers below the ankle is makru that means wearing the trousers above the ankle is sunnah while the other scholars say that wearing the trousers below the ankle it is haram and wearing above the ankle is a fard in all the four schools of thought in the hanafi school of thought in the maliki school of thought in the shafi school of thought in the humbly school of thought there are scholars many of them who have said that wearing trousers below the ankle is makru or wearing above the ankle is sunnah as well as there are scholars who say that wearing below the ankle is haram and wearing above the ankle is a fard there are various hadith which speak about the subject of the izar or the trousers or the lower garment below the ankle and the hadith in sahih bukhari volume number 7 hadith number 5787 where abu huraira may allah be pleased with him says that the prophet peace be upon him said that the izar the lower garment that hangs below the ankle is in the fire of hell sahih hadith it's in bukhari and there are various sahih hadith in bukhari in sahih muslim and other books of hadith it is further mentioned in sahih al bukhari volume number 7 hadith number 5790 the abdullah ibn umar may allah be pleased with him he says that prophet muhammad peace be upon him said that once a man was walking with is izar trailing on the ground and allah subhanahu wa taala made him go beneath in the earth and he kept on going beneath till the day of resurrection there is a hadith in sahih bukhari volume number 7 hadith number 5791 abdul ibn umar may allah be pleased with him says that the prophet peace be upon him said that anyone whose izar trails around in the on the ground with pride and arrogance allah will not look at him on the day of judgment there hadith even in sahih muslim it's mentioned in sahih muslim volume number 1 hadith number 293 where abu dar may allah be pleased him says that the prophet muhammad peace be upon him said that there are three categories of people who allah will not speak to who will not look at and will not sanctify the sahaba asked who are these people the prophet said the person who hangs his izar below the ankle the person who reminds of the gifts he has given and the person who sells his products with false oath a similar hadith is mentioned in sahih muslim point number 1 hadith number 294 where abu dar may allah be pleased him says that the prophet peace be upon him said that allah will not look at the person allah will not look at three types of people the person who doesn't give gifts doesn't give gifts and reminds people of his generosity a person who sells his products by false oath and a person whose izar hangs below the ankle now there are various hadith there are hadith in tirmidhi in abu daud various hadith why are the scholars divided whether it is haram or whether it is makru because those scholars that say it is makru they say that only keeping the trousers below the ankle per se is not haram if you do it with pride and arrogance then it is haram so if you only keep your trousers below the ankle without pride and without arrogance it is not haram it is makru and they say that if 
there is a general hadith and a specific hadith the specific hadith takes prevalence should be followed rather than the general hadith so specific hadith says that trousers below the ankle with pride and arrogance then further they give the example of the hadith in which has Abu Bakr may Allah be peace with him his trousers slips down and he tells to the prophet that one part of my idhar keeps on going down so my trousers go below the ankle so the prophet replies we know that there is no pride in you so based on this those scholars who say that it is makru they say that only if your idhar is below the ankle with pride and arrogance it is haram otherwise it's not haram now as compared to and they also give the example of ibn masud the hadith says that ibn masud his izar was low and he said that i am thin that's the reason i have worn the izar low so based on this they say that how come the sahabas of abu bakr may allah be with him the prophet allowed him and told him that you don't have pride and ibn masud they said that now this group of scholars their argument is refuted by the other group of scholars who say that below the ankle is haram and they give the argument by saying that yes the specific hadith if you see there are various hadith there are several hadith which say only izar below the ankle the trousers below the ankle will be in hellfire and the prophet clearly mentioned whether it be your trouser whether it be your shirt kameez whether it be your thob whether it be your turban if it's below the ankle then it is haram where is hadith so what they say that this ruling here of specific and general does not apply because pride by itself is haram so if pride by itself is haram so whether you wear the trousers below the ankle with pride or without pride doesn't make a difference so wearing trouser below the ankle itself is haram because that is the sign of being proud and when a beloved prophet mustafa sallallahu alaihi wasallam told to abu bakr may allah be peace with him that we know that you are not proud here we fail to realize that abu bakr radhiyallahu an he tied his trousers on the waist but because he had a paunch it kept on slipping and he kept on again tying it on top so here the main niya of abu bakr may allah be pleased with him was to wear the trousers above the ankle it slipped down then again he put it on top it slipped down again he put it on top then the prophet says there's no sin on you we know that you are not you are not proud in case of the other hadith of ibn masud may allah be pleased with him there are several hadith if we, we know the hadith of abdul ibn umar may allah be pleased with him that once the prophet tells him that when his trouser slips down below the ankle the prophet says put your trousers on top so abdul ibn umar he ties his trousers above the ankle the prophet is more on top he ties more on top more on top uh, again more on top and then he told abdul ibn umar may allah be with him that i never let my trousers below this point people asked him what was the point in which the prophet told you to keep the trouser so he said it was midway between my calf from the knee to the ankle mid calf so this is mustahab to wear the trousers on the mid calf is mustahab there there, there another hadith of the if may allah be pleased with him we says that the prophet cut his calf and said this is the position where your trouser should be anything below that is permissible as long as it is above the ankle below the ankle is haram so here we come to know that the mustahab level the best level of wearing the trouser is on the mid calf below the mid calf and above the ankle it is permissible it is mubah and below the ankle it is haram so when the hadith of ibn masud may allah be pleased with him it was lower it doesn't say lower the ankle it doesn't say that his trousers is izar were below the ankle it says it was low so what we understand from this hadith it was lower than the mid calf and ibn masud may allah be pleased with him says that because he is thin 
he preferred wearing it lower than the mid calf but not lower than the ankle no way that the hadith say that ibn masud may allah be pleased with him wore the ankle below the ankle it only says it was low so what we have to understand it was lower than the mustahab level of mid calf so all, and imagine do you mean to say when the prophet told to abu bakr may allah be pleased with him that we know that you are not proud at the same time tells to ibn masud sorry tells to abdul ibn umar that you keep the towels on top put the towels on top does it mean to say that the prophet is trying to say that ibn masud may allah be pleased with him the prophet is trying to say that abdul ibn umar he was proud peace be upon him and the answer is no that means that normally you have to keep the trousers above the ankle if it slips down because of certain level like because your tummy is big then allah will forgive you from this we come to know so those scholars who say it is haram they say that if your intention is to wear the trousers above the ankle and if it slips down because of the structure that you are because of your paunch that you have and then you put it on top again if it slips down then allah will forgive you because the intention is to wear the trousers above the ankle and there are several scholars as i said the scholars are divided some say it is makru but all agree it is minimum sunna if not haram those scholars will say it's not haram to wear below the ankle they agree it is mustahab and a very high level mustahab that if you wear the trousers to wear the trousers above the ankle is a sunna if not a fard and they say it's a very high level of sunna and to wear the trousers below the ankle if they say it's not haram they say it is makru and a very high level of makru and as i mentioned in all the four schools of thought there are scholars who say wearing above the ankle is sunna below the ankle is makru yet there are scholars who say it is fard to wear above the ankle and is haram to wear below the ankle in the hanafi school of thought we have maulana ashraf ali thanvi who says that all those who say that i can wear the trousers below the ankle without pride they are wrong that itself is pride so he says that to wear it below the ankle with pride is a major sin and to wear it below the ankle without pride is also a major sin but wearing it with pride is a graver major sin than wearing it without pride but even wearing it without pride not only is it a sin it is a major sin in the maliki school of thought you have you have the scholar ibn al arbi who says the same thing that wearing it below the ankle wearing trousers below the ankle is haram anyone who says it is makru has an understood the hadith of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you if you read the fatwas of the shafi for example ibn hajar ibn hajar asqalani he says that wearing below the ankle is haram and wearing above the ankle is a fard even if you read the fatwas of imam adhabi imam adhabi says that wearing below the ankle is not only haram it is a major sin and wearing above the ankle is a fard and in his book the qabair that is the major sin he lists isbal wearing the trousers above the ankle is a fard wearing it below the ankle he says is the 55th major sin and some people who say that no wearing the below the ankle with pride is a major sin in the same book kabair he lists pride and arrogance as the 17th major sin so if only pride and arrogance is 17th major sin and pride arrogance with trousers below the ankle how can that be number 55 it has to be higher so this proves that the number 55 sin 
Imam Adhabi is only talking about wearing trousers below the ankle. And major sin number 17 is only talking about pride and arrogance. If you have pride, even an atom's weight of pride, then Allah will put you in hellfire. And there are various sayhadith. So pride and arrogance is major sin number 17 according to Imam Adhabi and his book Kabayat. And wearing trousers below the ankle is major sin number 55. I personally agree with those group of scholars who say that wearing the trousers above the ankle is fard and wearing a trouser below the ankle is not only haram, it is a major sin. I agree with Imam al dhabi and his argument I agree with more with that group of scholars. Even if you read the humbly schools of thought, scholars, many of them say it is not haram, including Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah. Sheikh al-Islam, Sheikh Ibn Taymiyyah, according to him, wearing the trousers below the ankle is not haram. But you have various other scholars who say it is haram. And if you go to the scholars of the recent times, or the recent past, there are many scholars who say it is haram. For example, Sheikh bin Baz, then uh, Sheikh Muhammad Saleh of Taymi, uh, Sheikh Abdullah ibn Jibreen, all these scholars according to them, wearing trousers below the ankle is haram and wearing trousers above the ankle is a fard. So as for your question is concerned, is it a sunnah or is it compulsory to wear above the ankle? According to me, I agree with those group of scholars and I believe their decision, their fatwa, that wearing above the ankle is a fard, I agree with that. Wearing below the ankle, it is haram. And I also agree with Imam Adhabi who says, and including Ashraf Ali Thanvi, Maulana Ashraf Ali Thanvi, may Allah, may Allah mercy on him, I believe that it is a major sin. That's the reason that all the staff in Bombay that we had, all the male staff, we had 500 staff out of which more than 400 were males, that it was compulsory as a dress code in our office that all the staff had to wear their trousers above the ankle. It was compulsory. I know that it may look like a joker, especially if you're wearing a suit and wearing a tie. You know, if you wear a thobe or if you wear a idar, it may not look that bad. But if you're wearing a suit, it may look like a joker, no problem. So when people want to follow as a fashion, you know, in India, in the Bollywood, uh, we had an actor by the name of Raj Kapoor. He wore trousers above the ankle. So we find many of the Indians started wearing above the ankle. I mean, who is Raj Kapoor to follow? The best example is the Prophet Muhammad The way he dressed. If you have to imitate anyone, the best person is the Prophet. So I agree with those group of scholars who say that wearing trousers above the ankle is a fard and wearing trousers below the ankle is not only a sin, it is a major sin. Hope that's the question. We have on the Facebook Samuel S. Musa Sayyid Rasta Firoz Akhtar M.K. Siam John Doe Kamal Hassan Yaya Ibrahim Rintu Sheikh, Muhammad Waqas, Abdurrahman Katani, all of them saying Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Salam. Jana Lon, Samuel S. The next question is from Abdul Karim 
from New York, USA. Is it permissible for a Muslim man to marry a Christian woman? If yes, are there any conditions? Can he marry her even if she believes Jesus is be upon to be God? This is a very important question asked by Brother Abdul Karim from New York, USA. That is it permissible for a Muslim man to marry a Christian girl or a girl from the Ali Kitab? Are there any condition? Can he marry her if she believes Jesus is God? As far as marrying, as far as a Muslim man marrying a Christian girl is concerned, Allah clearly mentions in the glorious Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 5, that lawful for you are those things that are good and pure. Lawful for you are the food of the Ahle Kitab. And lawful for you in marriage are the chaste believing woman, the Mohsenat, the chaste believing woman and the chaste woman among the Ahle Kitab. So based on this verse of the Quran, the Quran is very clear cut and it says that a Muslim man can marry a chaste woman from the Ahle Kitab. There are some people who say, okay, the Ahle Kitab at the time of the Prophet, they did not believe that Jesus was God, etc. These people who say this is not wrong, they are, they are wrong. They don't know the Quran clearly mentions that it is mentioned that the Ahle Kitab, the Christians used to do kuf in Surah Maida chapter 5, verse number 72, that they believed that Jesus is God. They did kuf by saying they believed in Trinity in Surah Maida chapter 5, verse number 73, and I'll come to it later on. But the majority of the scholars, all of them, they say that it is permissible to marry as long as she is chaste. There is a criteria, there is a condition put on that which woman from the Ali Kitab can you marry. And the Quran in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 4 is very explicit and says that you can marry the chaste woman from the moment, from the believers. Mohsenat from the Mominat. And Mohsenat from the Ahle Kitab. The condition is that she should be chaste. Now based on this condition, the least you can expect a chaste woman to be least. There are various conditions for being chaste, for being Mohsenat. The minimum, the minimum condition, the lowest is that she should be a virgin. And today we find, since the question is asked from USA, from New York, Today we know according to the statistics that we have of the western countries, they say that the woman, the girl, some statistics say the girl in the school 90% lose their virginity. Other statistics say that the girl by the time she passes college or university, 95% lose their virginity. Some say 98%. Even, even if you know the statistics of Europe, of UK, most of the statistics, almost all, they say that by the time a woman passes her university, some say 95% lose their virginity, some say 96, some say 97, but all of them agree it is more than 95%. So, one of the minimum criteria for Mohsenath for being chased is that you should be virgin. There are many other criteria. So based on this, hardly you will find any woman, especially in the western country, who will be chaste. And I was born in Bombay, I lived my life in Bombay, I passed my medical college in Bombay. And I remember that after I passed my medical college, in the early part of the 20th century, of the 21st century, sorry, in the year 2002 or 2001, there was an AIDS conference in Bombay. And according to the statistics in that conference, we were told that in Bombay, on average, 70% of the girls lose their virginity before they pass standard 10. 
and were shocking to me. Bombay, uh, India is much more conservative than America, than the Western country, and that is talking about 20 years back. So today what we come to know that in this 21st century, it is very difficult for a woman to remain chaste, especially in the Western countries, and now it's also coming to the Eastern countries. And the scholars, most of them they discourage. Though it's permissible, but they say they should be chaste. So where will you find a chaste woman from the Heli Kitab, a chaste Christian woman? And even if you marry, the problem that we see after that is phenomenal. There are high chances that after a Muslim man marries a Christian girl or a Jewish girl, there are high chances that the marriage will not be successful. And we find that the way of dressing differs, the way of eating differs, the way of behavior differs. And imagine the cleanliness is not there. Imagine the Christian woman during menstruation, she may not inform the husband. And you know it's haram to have an intercourse during the cycle. Whether will she be able to clean herself very well? The eating habits are different. And in Western world, it is quite common that many of the Muslim men, they marry Christian women. And these men actually are not very practicing Muslims. So what we find them doing, that after they marry, when they go to the grocery, they are buying alcohol for their wife, they are buying pork for their wife. They may not drink themselves, but they are buying it for their wife. Many of them, maybe they were drinking before marriage. Many of them were not drinking, start drinking alcohol after marriage. All these things are common. And we find that many a times if the marriage doesn't work, it ends in a divorce. And when there's a divorce, and if you have children, then you are Muhammad, and you are Abdullah, and you are Abdurrahman, and you are Fatima, and you are Khatija, they are going to church. So, I personally, I'll give my view later on, the additional criteria. Most of the scholars, they do not encourage a Muslim man to marry a woman from the Ahle Kitab. It's permissible, but the criteria is she should be Mohsenat. And where will you find a Mohsenat? And even if you find a Mohsenat, there are yet problems. So, a person who is a religious Muslim will never venture into this. And most of the cases that you have, when a Muslim man is marrying a Christian girl, 99.9 .9 cases are love marriages. The moment you have girlfriend and boyfriend, it means that you are not chaste. So what do you do? You go out with a girl, go for a movie, go out for eating, go out for dancing. Where is she chaste? Leave aside virginity, even going out for dancing with an amaram, going out to see a movie, it is against the value of chaste. She is not a Mohsenat. So, if you apply the strict criteria of a Christian woman with Mohsenat, hardly you will be able to find. And practically to follow this advice today in this 21st century is very difficult. And we know the problem that can happen after marriage. According to the call of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him. He says that a Muslim man can only marry a Hale Kitab woman in an Islamic state. She cannot marry, he cannot marry a Christian woman or a Jewish woman if it is in a foreign country. And there are a group of scholars who agree with this view of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, and even I agree with this view. Because if you marry a Christian girl in a non-Muslim country and if anything happens, they will follow their law, they will not follow the Islamic law. If there is a divorce, then your children, as I mentioned, Muhammad, Sultan, Abdullah, Khatija, Fatma will go to church. So, but natural, it is not encouraged at all. 
So I agree with the view of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, that this is only permissible to marry a Christian woman. Number one should be chaste, and number two in an Islamic state. Besides agreeing with the view of Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, I personally have another condition based on my studies of the Quran. I don't claim to be a scholar, I'm a student of knowledge, and my speciality is Islam and comparative religion. So I have my additional criteria based on the Quran. It's not my criteria, it's my study of the Quran. As I mentioned earlier in the starting of my answer, Allah is very clear cut in Surah Maida, chapter number five. Verse number five. Lawful for you are all things that are good and pure. Lawful for you are the people, lawful for you are the food of the Ahle Kitab, of the people of the book. And the verse continues. Lawful for you in marriage, besides the chaste women who are believers, are the chaste women from the Ahle Kitab. This verse is there. But there's another verse in the glorious Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 221, which says that do not marry an unbelieving woman. Do not marry a, a mushrika, an idolatress, a woman who does shirk, unless she believes. A believing woman who is a slave woman is much better than an unbelieving woman, than a mushrikat, even if she allows you. That means the Quran is very clear cut in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 221, that a Muslim can only marry a woman. A Muslim cannot marry a mushrikat, cannot marry a non-Muslim, unless she becomes a Muslim. A Muslim woman who is a slave woman, a born woman, is much better than a mushrikat, an unbelieving woman, even if she allows you. She may be the richest woman in the world. She may be the most beautiful woman in the world. She may be very attractful. But a believing woman who is a slave woman, who is a bond woman, is much better for a Muslim man than an unbelieving woman, a non-Muslim woman. It's very clear cut. A mushrikat. That means you cannot marry a Hindu. But if there is exception in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 5, that you can marry a chaste woman from the Ali Kitab. Quran is very explicit in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, where it says that, Lakat kafra lazina kalu, inna lahu, huwal masyub numarema. They are doing kufr, they are blaspheming those who say that Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. That means Quran is very clear cut in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, that the Christians, they say that Allah is Christ, the son of Mary. And the verse continues. They blaspheme those who say that Jesus, that Allah is Jesus Christ, the son of Mary. Waqal al Masih, but that, but that Christ. Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, O Budullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who is my Lord and your Lord. In my shrik billah, anyone who associates partners with Allah, Fakad haram Allah al Jannah, Allah will make Jannah haram for him. Wama wa hunnar, wama al Zalimil min ansar, and fire shall be dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. Here, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran is very clear cut and he says that they are doing kufr, they are blaspheming those who say that Allah is Christ the son of Mary. But said Christ, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who is my Lord and your Lord. Inna ma yishrik billah, anyone who associates partners with Allah, faqad haram Allah alayhi jannah. Allah will make Jannah haram for him. Wama wa hunnar, wama resolve me min ansar, and fire shall be dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. So this was the message of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, which is conveyed in the glorious Quran. But Allah also says that these Christians they say that 
Allah is Jesus the son of Mary. No spell. Allah further says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 73. Kalu inna Allahu salasa. They are doing kufr. They are blaspheming those who say that Allah is three in one. Allah is Trinity. <coughs> <clears throat> so here the Quran says that Christians are doing kufr by saying Jesus Christ peace be upon him the almighty God they believe in trinity Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 221 says you cannot marry someone who does shirk Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 5 says you can marry chaste women from the Helikita so all these verses put together they seem to be an apparent contradiction. If Allah is very clear cut in the Quran that the Ahle Kitab they do shirk and the Quran says a mu'min cannot marry a mushrikat. So how come Surah Maida says that you can marry Ahle Kitab they seem to be a contradiction and Allah is very clear cut in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 82 do they not consider the Quran with care? Do they not ponder over the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. So there cannot be a contradiction. So Alhamdulillah, since I'm in the field of comparative religion, there is one verse of the Quran which gives the reply to this question. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, Chapter number 3, verse number 110, which is a very famous verse. Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatin khridatlin nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of peoples evolved for mankind. Ta'miruna bil ma'rofi wa tanhauna an munkar wa tu'minuna billah. Because we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. So, this verse of the Quran is a very important verse saying that the Muslim ummah is the best of the people evolved for mankind. And the reason is because we enjoy what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. This is a very famous verse but this is not the complete verse. <coughs> this is half the verse. The verse continues. It would have been better for them if the Ahl Kitab had faith. Woman it would have been better for them if the Ahle Kitab had faith, had belief. Min humul mu'minun awaksaramul fasikun. Among them, there are some who are believers, but the majority are perverted transgressors. So here in Surah Imran, chapter 3, verse 110, Allah says that among the Ahle Kitab, there are some who are mu'min. But the majority of poverty transgressors. So the one criteria which all the scholars agree is that the woman from the LA Kitab should be Mohsinat. And there's no doubt about it. Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, puts another criteria that it should only be, the marriage should only be done in a Muslim state. Otherwise not valid. I say according to Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse 110, among the LA Kitab there are some who are mu'min. That means they're believers. That means they don't believe that Jesus is God. They don't believe in Trinity. So you can only marry the Mohsenat Ahle Kitab. The chaste Ahle Kitab who are mu'min. It will not contradict against the verse of the Quran of Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 221. So according to me, in my humble study, I don't, I don't claim to be a scholar, the additional criteria besides the woman being chaste and besides it being in an Islamic state, the third criteria, she should be a mu'min. That means, she should not believe that Jesus is God. She should not believe in Trinity. And at the time of the Prophet, there were such people. The example is Warqa bin Nawfil, who was the cousin of Hazrat Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her. And he was a mu'min. He was a Christian, but he was a mu'min. That is the reason you find that there are very few Sahabas. It's permissible. I'm not saying it's haram, but there are criteria. That woman, that Ahle Kitab woman, 
the Krishna Jewish woman should be a Mohsenat, should be chaste, should be in Islamic state and should be Mormon, she should not do shirk. That is the reason. There are very few Sahabas, I think. Uh, uh, Hudayfa, may Allah be pleased with him. Talai ibn Ubaidah, may Allah be pleased with him. Very few Sahabas who had wives from the Heli Kitab. But my advice to the Muslims, especially in the Western country, is that don't take undue advantage of this verse and think that it's fine. This verse is very explicit that she should be a Mohsenat, a chaste woman. To get chaste women is extremely difficult. And if you apply the condition of Ibn Abbas that it should be a Muslim state, the but natural, the questioner is from New York, is from Western country. I would totally disagree that a Muslim man should marry a woman from the Hale Kitab, especially in the Western country. Even if in the Islamic country, she should be a Mohsenat and she should be a believer, she should be a Mormon. And what we find that most of these marriages are love marriages. How can she, how can she be Mohsenat? Okay, if you find a woman who was a Christian woman who accepted Islam because she liked Islam, no problem. Someone who accepts Islam and she's a revert and then you marry, no problem. But you get into love with her, you go to college together or you go to university together or you're working together and then you fall in love and then you say that it is Islam allows and then you may go to a Qadi and maybe say the Shahada for namesake, this is only plastic surgery. There are high chances that your children, your Muhammad, your, your Abdullah, your Fatima, your Khadija will go to church. I totally disagree. Not only, and these type Muslims are not practicing Muslim. A practicing Muslim actually would not fall in love with a girl, with a Christian girl. So, but naturally, because the deen is weak, your deen is weak, and then you take an excuse from the verse of the Quran and marry. I'm not making permissible haram. I'm saying there are conditions and it's very difficult, very, very difficult to find such thing. So my advice to the Muslim young men and young boys is that please don't use this verse of the Quran as an excuse to marry the Christian woman. There are various conditions. It's almost very difficult to fulfill these conditions and doing it in a non-Muslim country also is not permitted according to many scholars and I agree with that. And these are only infatuations. You're living in a Western country, you go to work, you go to school. So these things we should be away from. If you really find a revered girl who's accepted Islam not because you've fallen in love and she's following the principles of Islam and she's praying five times a day and is a good modest woman, then there's no problem. But please don't get involved in love and then you say it is allowed in Islam. Please stay away from it. It will be not only bad for you, but for the generations to come. Hope that answers the question. And the next question from Sayyid Vasai Ur Rahman Shah from Rawal Pindi, Pakistan. What is the solution of stammering? I know you also had this problem, so please tell me a dua by which I can solve this problem. Brother Sayyid Vasai asked a question that what is the solution for stammering and he knows that I used to stammer in childhood. So what is the solution? What is the dua that he can pray? Stammering is a speech disorder which affects the flow and the fluency of speech. And there can be various reasons. There can be a speech motor disorder. It can be genetic. It can be due to a brain injury. It can be a neurological problem. So the various reasons that they can be the stammering or stuttering. Stammering or stuttering in young children between the age of 2 and 5 is common. After that, if it continues with this, with this prolonged gap or the repetition of word, then there's a problem and you should have it checked up. 
if you have a stammering you have to find out what is the cause of stammering is it due to a speech motor disorder it is is it due to psychological reason is it is it genetic and there are therapies available speech therapists are there you can go and show it to speech therapists and they will try and find out what the cause is and try and give you a remedy as far as i am concerned as many of you may be aware that i used to stammer since childhood and i continued stammering till i was in college and if someone asked me what is your name i would say my name is za 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 zakir this is how a person stammer and you stammer a lot and i realized that when i met sheikh ahmed didad in 1987 december the first time and i got involved in the field of dawa i realized that when i used to speak with the christian missionaries i never used to stammer it was like a miracle a mojiza in 1991 when we started our foundation islamic research foundation there was one of my friend who was also good in comparative religion so i said let's have a question and session and i made the platform for him but when he went to answer on the stage he got cold feet he said to stammer and this is common a person when you goes on the stage it is common that a person who goes the first time on the stage he stammers so that is not an organic stammering or it's not due to speech disorder due to fear so my friend he got cold feet and there was no option but i went on the stage and i started answering and i realized that on the stage i did not stammer at that time most of the audience were muslim it was weird a normal person on the stage stammer the person who stammers on the stage you stammer more but it was a mojiza from allah subhanahu wa taala when i went on the stage i did not stammer and then i realized that whenever i spoke on the stage i started speaking on the stage my stammering vanished when i came down from the stage it again started when i spoke with the non muslim while doing dawa my stammering vanished when i spoke with, when i spoke with the muslim again it started as to speak on the phone i used to stammer then by allah's grace alhamdulillah you know i kept on doing more and more dawa as i kept on doing more and more dawa my stammering kept on reducing and whenever i started my speech i used to recite the dua that was recited by musa alaihi salam by prophet moses peace be upon him and this dua is there in surah taha chapter number 20 verse number 25 to 28 which says rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli this is the dua recited by musa alaihi salam in surah taha chapter number 20 verse number 25 to 28 though in the quran it says qala rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli that means that musa alaihi salam prays to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that o oh my lord expand my breast for me rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassir li amri and make my task easy for me wa hlul uqdatam min lisani and remove the impediment from my speech yafqahu qawli so that they understand me here we know from the sira that musa alaihi salam was a stammerer he used to stutter so he prays to allah subhanahu wa taala oh my lord expand my breath for me make me bold make me capable and make my task easy for me and remove the impediment from my speech now here this has two meaning one is the stuttering that was there in the speech of musa alaihi salam and even i used to stutter the second meaning is that if there is a barrier between the speaker and the audience so even a person who is not stammering he reads this dua to ask allah subhanahu wa taala to remove the barrier the in, the impediment between the speaker and the audience and the next verse says so that they may understand me and we know that when musa alaihi salam was asked by allah subhanahu wa taala to go and deliver the message to firon he says that why don't you give me support and then allah subhanahu wa taala makes his brother harun alaihi salam who was good in speech to accompany him in 
my childhood or in my early youth age before I got involved in the field of Dawa, I used to stammer so much I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people. I could have dreamt of becoming the best surgeon in the world. In your dreams, you can dream anything. But I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people because I was a stammerer. I could have dreamt of becoming the best doctor in the world, the best surgeon in the world. But I could not have dreamt of speaking in front of 25 people because I was a stammerer. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His gifts, through His mercy, has a min fazirat. It is due to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I got involved in the field of dawah, my stammering vanished. Now yet I stammer, but I know how to overcome it. By the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I kept on going more on the stage, my stammering kept on reducing. And mashallah, by Allah's grace, I started addressing audience. It was first few hundred, then became few thousand, then became tens of thousand. And alhamdulillah, the largest gathering that I've addressed live is in Kishan Ganj in 2012, where there were more than a million people, alhamdulillah. So this is nothing but a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who cannot speak in my school days in public speaking, I used to get PF. PF is pass fail. Because the teacher knew that I used to stammer. Allah makes me a public speaker. I never dreamt of it. I never got involved in the field of Dawa to become a public speaker. I never started IRF Islamic Research Foundation to become a public speaker. I started as a platform for people to get some information and let other people speak. So Allah has his planning. Allah has his miracle. Hadha min Rabbi. So as far as the dua, the best treatment is Allah subhanahu wa shafi. I would request to you, yes, you can go to a doctor. Allah says, Fasalu ahli zikri in gumdula ta'lamun. In Surah Nahl, chapter 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter 20, verse 7, if you don't know, ask the person who knows. So, but natural, go to a doctor, go to a speech therapist, check it up, they may give you a therapy. But the dua you can recite is of Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 25 to 28. And this is the dua I always say in the beginning of my speech. And even before today's speech, I said that. So if you can keep on deciding this dua, inshallah this dua can help you relieve your stammering. And inshallah I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He completely free you from the stuttering and from stammering. And inshallah make you a good speaker and a good dayas. Facebook. <coughs> Sorry, my Facebook is not my Facebook is not working so they can see on the Facebook. There's a question on the Facebook by Aminur, Aminur Islam Shawon. The name sounds like this from Bangladesh. Can I give my zakat for my cousin's treatment purpose? She has her mom and a husband. The question poses that can I give my zakat to my cousin for some medical treatment? Yes. If your cousin doesn't have the means and if she is not rich enough and cannot take the treatment, you can. It can either come in two or three different categories. There are eight categories where zakat can be given. It's in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 60. That zakat can be given to a fuqara, a person who is poor. Zakat can be given to, to a masakin, a person who is needy, to an amilun who collects zakat. To Muwalla Futur Qulub, whose heart is coming towards Islam, to a Rikab for freeing a slave, a Gharimun, a letter, it can be 
to an Ibn Sabil, a wayfarer, and fi sabrillah in the way of Allah. As far as the treatment of the, for treatment is concerned, if your cousin is a fuqara, is poor, doesn't have a, a nisab level or savings of more than 85 grams of gold, she be called fuqara, you can give it to her. Or she may be having a saving of more than the nisab level, but she may not have enough money to do a treatment. She may have a heart attack or she may have some kidney problem. She may not be a fuqara, but she may be needy. She may not have enough money to do the treatment. So if your cousin falls in the category where she doesn't have enough money herself to pay, very well you can pay from your zakat money in the masakin category, or if she's poor in the fuqara category, or in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If she falls in any of these three categories, very well you can give zakat to her. The next question asked by Altaf Siddiqui from Mumbai. Is general insurance or life insurance halal? A similar question is asked by Umar Mukhtar from Kashmir. Can one insure one's house and shop? As you might be knowing that in Kashmir, there are regular encounters in which houses and shops are blown up. The question poses that is general insurance or life insurance permitted? Can the Muslims in Kashmir insure their house? because it's blown up, etc. Insurance per se is not haram. But because of the things associated with, in, with insurance, most of the time it's haram. The conventional insurance that we have, or the commercial insurance, the reason it's haram is because it, is, it has three criteria which are haram. Number one, the reason of ambiguity. Number two, it has an element of gambling and number three is Raba. In a, in a conventional insurance, what happens? It may be a car insurance, it may be health insurance, it may be a car insurance, you may buy insurance of the car and the full year nothing happens. So the owner of the company of the insurance gets the profit and you don't get its ambiguity. Or if an accident takes place, the company pays for the repair of the damage, it may be excessive, so you benefit and the company goes in loss, there's ambiguity. There's an element of gambling also, for example, take a life insurance and thing happens to you, or health insurance, take out a health insurance and nothing happens to you for the full year and yet you're paying. So scholars have clubbed these two categories together, ambiguity and gambling. This is one of the major reasons that insurance is haram. And the other reason is, the second or the third reason is that most of these conventional insurance company, they keep the money in banks or they invest in money instruments which involves interest or riba. So based on these criteria, the conventional insurance is haram. But there is something like an Islamic insurance known as takaful. So if you take takaful, which is Islamic insurance, it is not a commercial insurance, it is more of a corporate insurance. In, in a conventional insurance or a commercial insurance, the owner of the company gets major of the profit. In a corporate insurance, the people, all of them are shareholders. So takaful reduces the ambiguity, reduces the element of gambling or removes it completely. These people who are involved in takaful, they all are shareholders. And they give as though they're giving donation. And they give donation and whoever requires it gets the benefit. Based on the hadith, that once during wartime when the food, there was scarcity of food. So the sahabas collect the food from all the people and they distribute it equally. That means all of them give the food and then they collect what it is and they distribute equally. So this is permitted. So in takaful what happens, all of the members are shareholders. So just in case if no accident takes place, no one is sick, what happens? That money goes back to the shareholder. In the conventional banking, if no one gets sick, who benefit? The owner, the commercial insurance, the, the one who owns the insurance benefit. Here, it goes back to the shareholder. So the element of ambiguity is reduced, the element of gambling is reduced, and it is more of 
helping each other based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 2, that help one another in bir and taqwa, in righteousness, in piety, and in virtue. So based on this verse of the Quran, the taqaful is formed. They see to it that the Islamic Sharia is followed and all the haram is not there. And if the taqaful invest, they see to it that they don't invest in a riba-based investment. They invest in a Sharia compliant investment. So the money that comes, they put in a Sharia compliant, which is based on the principles of the Sharia. It does not involve riba. It does not involve interest. So if you take an insurance that is taqaful insurance, Based on the Islamic principles, it's permitted, but the normal conventional insurance or the commercial insurance, it is haram, it is prohibited, you should not involve whether it's in Kashmir, whether any part of the world, whether a bomb is going to break your house or not, it is not allowed, you should not do it, unless someone is forcing you. Like in some countries, taking out third party, taking out insurance of the car is compulsory, like in India, and there's no takaful. So what do you do? You take out a third party insurance, the minimum requirement is a third party, not a comprehensive insurance. So if there's no takaful in countries like India, you can take out a third party insurance, but don't take out a full comprehensive insurance. Full comprehensive insurance will have the element of ambiguity, will have the element of gambling, will have the element of riba. In a third party insurance, you don't benefit at all. If a third party sues you, then the company will pay on your behalf. So you're not benefiting. It's a small amount. So if someone is forcing you to take out an insurance, whether the company says health insurance, and you have no say of it, then even if it's a conventional insurance, somebody is forcing you, in that case it's permitted, but you voluntarily doing it, if someone is not forcing you, it is haram. However, if someone is forcing you and if takaful is there, take takaful. If it's not there, the last resort, you can take the conventional insurance, but take the lowest category. Voluntary, if you are living in a Muslim country or a country which has the takaful and you want to take, that's permitted. But taking voluntary, intentionally, a conventional insurance, it is haram. But takaful based on the Islamic Sharia is permitted. And time has run short and that would be the last question that I answered. And I would like to thank the audience for asking these questions. Inshallah, we will meet Next Saturday, five minutes early, that is 11 o'clock time in Malaysia, 3 o'clock GMT, 6 o'clock Makkah timing for the program Ask Dr. Zakir and his son Farik. Till then, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Akhirul Dawan, Alhamdulillah.